The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you, as a believer priest, the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So you have the next few moments of silent prayer to do so. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word of God and this subject today. We ask that God the Holy Spirit will enlighten us and give us the concentration necessary to assimilate these doctrines into our stream of consciousness. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. We're beginning a study of the Christian alcoholic and or addict. Both kind of go hand in hand and together, the alcoholic and the drug addict. And first of all, we have to establish some parameters in order to understand that we're all coming from the same area, the same viewpoint. First of all, can you be a Christian and at the same time an alcoholic? And the answer is of course. Now if you have a legalistic background and you don't believe in eternal security, then this isn't going to be the message for you at all. Uh, but uh, if you're an alcoholic, then of course you're probably not in the legalistic wing of the uh, what would be Christianity. So you can be a Christian and an alcoholic at the same time and say, how is it possible? You have an old sin nature, that's how. And uh, we will be studying how a lot of it has to do with genetics. And guess what? The old sin nature is passed down genetically. And uh, it comes from Adam and Noah, whom we will study a little later as well. So, of course, you can be a Christian and at the same time an alcoholic. You will not be a winner believer, absolutely not, but you'll, you'll be saved. And if you were to die drunk in a ditch, you're saved. You're going to heaven. And that's hard for the legalists to understand, but we're not going to focus on that right now. But we do have to establish that parameter. You can be a Christian and an alcoholic and or a drug addict, either one or both. Another uh, parameter we have to establish is that God's love never changes. Uh, when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you receive God's righteousness. Actually, a double portion. You receive God's righteousness and the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result, now you may not act like it, of course. Most of us never will, will, will actually none of us will reach perfection. And a lot of times, very few of us ever act as if we have any righteousness whatsoever. But God's love still never changes toward us. The day we believe in Jesus Christ, we have phileo, that's personal love from God, because we have His righteousness imputed to us by grace. If you don't understand grace, then uh, this message will not get through to you either. But an alcoholic would probably have an easier time understanding grace, but not necessarily, and we'll study that as well. The recovering alcoholic can oftentimes be the most self-righteous person while they used to be the hellraiser, now they're the most self-righteous person you've ever met. And worse than they were when they were an alcoholic, at least in terms of social life or in terms of likability, at least from the way I see it. But God's love never changes, no matter who you are or what you've done or what you're doing. If you're drunk right now, God's love for you is the same as when you're sober. Now, it's a hard concept for people who always humanize God to associate with because they don't understand grace. So a parameter, you're going to have to understand grace to understand this message at all. Otherwise you're just going to sit there angry. So you're all, if you're angry just turn it off and go on your own way because you're just not going to get it. Uh, another thing a lot of people bring up is the fact that an alcoholic is always an alcoholic. They can never recover. They're always a drunk. And that, that's not true. You can recover. God has never placed on any, any of us something we cannot recover from. As long as you're breathing, you have the ability to recover. Now, people may not think so, and people are oftentimes cruel in their approach to these matters. Oftentimes, they will just uh, consider you a drunk for the rest of your life. A while back, I came across an elderly lady who was a known alcoholic and she told me that she had broken her wrist and then she immediately had to follow up and say I wasn't drunk when it happened though and then she said now wasn't that stupid of me to say and not really because people are cruel and they'll bring it up even years after you've stopped drinking and uh, 
That's because people are cruel. Once you're drunk, you're always a drunk. But these people are wrong. The bird with a broken wing will never fly again, is what these people say. But God's grace says the bird with a broken wing will fly ever higher. You see, you just have an area of weakness that others do not have. In fact, it's estimated around 10% of the population has this genetic attribute that contributes to alcoholism. And others of you don't have that. You might have another uh, genetic predisposition towards something else. Now, if you're a practicing alcoholic, here's another parameter. And you may be listening to this because you saw the title of the message, and you say, oh, I may have a problem with alcohol or drugs or both, and I really want to quit, what should I do? Well, first of all, if you're a practicing alcoholic, that means if you're right now, you're sitting here, and you're listening to me, and you're, you're still thinking about, well, I really want to drink, take it. Because, and, the re and I'm not giving you bad advice, the reason I'm telling you this is because, first of all, if you are physically addicted to the substance, you're going to have to be weaned off of it by physicians. You're going to have to check yourself into a facility. I would never tell you to go cold turkey because that could lead to your death, even. And if you have any understanding of the uh, medical science behind it, no one would ever tell you to go cold turkey. That's stupid. You'll go into DT so quickly, and then uh, it's really un unnecessary pain, especially when we have the medicine today where you can go be treated. And then once you get rid of the physical addiction, then you can carry on with the recovery mentally, spiritually. But uh, until you break the physical addiction, you're, you're enslaved to it, and... Uh, you will die without it because your body has actually become enslaved to it through uh, metabolics. You are now, I mean, alcohol is just as much a part of your body as your blood. Your blood alcohol level, you are a walking blood alcohol, and alcohol must be in your blood in order for you to survive, and that is a fact, a medical fact. But they can wean you off by giving you certain drugs that will allow you to go without it, without the... DTs. And some of the signs, you say, well, I don't know if I've gone that far. One of the signs is uh, you stop drinking and your hand starts to tremble. That's a sign. There's very other, various other ways you can know. But you'll know because it's very, it'll be an uncomfortable feeling and uh, irritability, the rest of it. And you'll know whether you need to seek medical treatment or not. Now, some people do not need to seek the medical treatment, yet they're still alcoholics. They just haven't uh, taken it that far. They may, have been, they may have known a little bit more about alcohol than the other person, and they knew that it could result in DTs, whatnot, so they go about it in a different way. They just binge on a weekend or whatever, but they still have that genetic predisposition. But uh, again, as a parameter, I'm not going to tell you to stop doing what you're doing if you are physically addicted. If you're not physically addicted, then stop doing what you're doing, of course. There are other symptoms we'll go into later. There's also addiction to opiates. Those are what the old timers would call nerve pills. All of these involved alcohol and opiates are the two most dangerous, or one of the, two of the most dangerous, I won't say the most, heroin's on up there too, of course. But we have alcohol and opiates as being extremely dangerous because they're a suppressant. You always hear de uh, depressant. And it is. It depresses the central nervous system. It doesn't make you feel depressed, per se, but it depresses your nervous system. A lot of people, if they feel nervous, they say, I'm going to have a drink. It suppresses the nervous system. Now, for the alcoholic who drinks constantly all day or, or just drinks way too much in any area, just uh, constant drinking or even just uh, over-drinking in the evening after work or whatnot, the functioning alcoholic, there's a suppression of the central nervous hist uh, system. And uh, so when you wake up the next day, you have a hangover. And that hangover is related to your central nervous system waking back up from its suppression. And when you have overindulged in alcohol or you have taken opiates for so long that you're, you've, you're now dependent on those physically. I'm talking about a physical dependence, not just a mental one, but a physical one. 
you are physically dependent on an opiate, a nerve pill, or physically dependent on alcohol, what happens is your body overshoots the field, as it were, and it tries to compensate and it wakes up the nervous system and that's why it looks as if you're nervous. You, you have the DTs, your hands shake, etc. It's all part of the nervous system waking back up. That's the best way I can describe it for you to understand without using medical terms. And so oftentimes a way to suppress the uncomfortable feeling is to simply have another drink or take another pill and then that feeling goes away and then you feel quote normal so the only way an alcoholic can ever really feel normal if they've gone that far is to continue to drink and that is when you have become physically dependent and the best thing is to, rec is to recognize you have a problem before that happens but of course that doesn't always happen sometimes it takes the physical pain before uh, some people wake up, hard of learning, etc. Now, you can go to your primary medical doctor if you need to, but oftentimes they're going to send you straight to a facility or a hospital, so, so you might as well look up uh, which hospital you want to go to, which facility you need to go to, and go, and just get it over with and done with, and then start with the rehabilitation mentally spiritually especially. Post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. It's rehabilitation for, for no reason. We're all in it. So don't feel as if you are an inferior Christian. You're not. All of us need rehab from something. Now the fact that you had to go to rehab, so what? Some people need rehab from self-righteousness. They just don't have those centers. Centers. C-E-N-T-E-R-S. They don't have self-righteous centers or an SR meeting for self-righteous people. That would be the worst meeting ever anyway. Actually, they do. It's called church for a lot. <laughs> anyway, let me read to you from, and if you uh, are an alcoholic, you probably know what this book is. It's, uh, it's called The Big Book. It's Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, they have some pretty good ideas. It was, this was actually developed by a medical doctor back in the mid-1930s, and you have to understand, in the 1930s, academia had a lot more relationship to Christianity and Bible doctrine itself than it does today. You, you would not get any of this today from any type of academia, and they, he actually, this doctor gets very close to what you should do in the spiritual life, but he of course misses it because he's coming at it mainly from the perspective of the physical addiction. And then after the physical addiction, then what? And while he knows all the mechanics that relate to the medical diagnosis, he does not understand the mechanics related to the spiritual life. And that's why, I mean, even here there is an acknowledgement that recovery from alcoholism takes a power beyond what this doctor can provide and he's looking for it and this is where this book came about this guy going out looking for the answer looking for the solution to alcoholism which he oftentimes regarded as totally hopeless but again it's not hopeless and you're not helpless as long as you're alive God has a plan for your life doesn't matter what you've done, what type of depravity you've been involved in, God's there. And of course he wants you to have post-salvation, epistemological rehabilitation, what's that mean? He wants you to live your spiritual life. And you have failed in a way that most people don't. You have a different flaw even than most people have. You're part of the 10%, not the 90. Most believers go in for a different area of a tragic flaw called self-righteousness. And you just happen to be the 10% of believers who run off in the other direction. Drug abuse, alcohol abuse, uh, and along with that, all forms of depravity, fornication. You know, you lose your norms and standards. You lose, uh, you lose your norms and standards in that you do things in that state that you wouldn't do normally. And even the Apostle Paul brings that out when he says, drunkenness leads to debauchery. He knows what he's talking about. He's the Apostle Paul. Now I'm going to read from this 
because he was a doctor and his main concern as a doctor was dealing with alcoholism. He didn't understand it. He wanted to come to understand it and he wanted to help those suffering from it. He actually had a deep compassion for those suffering from it. And there's evidence he's a Christian, but of course he does not know the mechanics. And he may not even be a Christian, I don't know. But this is what he says, or at least this one doctor says this, to whom it may concern, I have specialized in the treatment of alcoholism for many years. In late 1934, I attended a patient who, though he had been a competent businessman of good earning capacity, was an alcoholic of a type I had come to regard as hopeless. In the course of his third treatment, he acquired certain ideas concerning a possible means of recovery. Now here's a man, and I'm going to have my asides on this because I'm going to be dealing with spiritual aspects that this guy cannot reach, cannot he come to comprehend probably. And uh, what, what right now we're talk he's uh, writing about a businessman who obviously is very smart, he's of good earning capacity, and as a businessman, he, he thinks, even though he's an alcoholic, alcoholics still think, and he's thinking, what can I do to stop this? So he came up with some ideas concerning a possible means of a recovery from this, and the book calls it the disease. It's not a disease. The only area where you could even come near to saying it's a disease is to say you become physically dependent. In other words, you made a choice to get to acquire this disease. You acquired it, and then once you have it, yeah, you're not going to get off of it except through medical help. And I guess that's the only place where you could say it's a disease, but it's one you brought on yourself. You chose to take one too many. And you say, well, not really. Yes, you did. You may, have, you may say, I didn't have control over it, and uh, there's uh, genetic evidence that that may be true, but even, even so, there, there was choice involved in taking the first drink. And we will see Noah in our study who took his first drink, and he did not stop. That is, and he didn't know what it was even, but he's still culpable for drunkenness. He was not held culpable for some other things that occurred that we'll go over but definitely held culpable for the drunkenness. Even though they, he didn't know what alcohol was. This was immediately after the flood. There had been no fermentation before the flood. There was no bacteria. So nobody was drunk before the flood. The first time uh, anyone had ever been drunk was Noah. And uh, remember, Noah was a, a great believer. He built the ark, etc. But anyway, continuing with the reading here. In the course of his third treatment, he acquired certain ideas concerning a possible means of recovery. As part of his rehabilitation, he commenced to present his conceptions to other alcoholics, impressing upon them that they must do likewise with still others. This has become the basis of a rapidly growing fellowship of these men and their families. This man and over 100 others appear to have recovered. And that's through the 12-step system they have here, which is wrought with human viewpoint, but it has been a lot of help for unbelievers and believers who have no interest in the Word of God. Uh, as a believer, well, we'll get into that later, is some of the caveat, caveats regarding should you go to AA, etc. Well, we'll get to that. Now, there are scores of cases, continuing the reading here. I personally know scores of cases who were of the type with whom other, met other methods had failed completely. These facts appear to be of extreme medical importance because of the extraordinary possibilities of rapid growth inherent in this group. They may mark a new epoch in the annals of alcoholism. These men may well have a remedy for thousands of such situations. You may rely absolutely on anything they say about themselves. William D. Silkworth, M.D. And uh, here is a doctor who had studied it and decided that this is hopeless and then he sees a man recover and he was a businessman who later came up with these steps here the 12 steps now what what we're calling this are God's 10 steps and God actually has post salvation epistemological rehabilitation you recover from alcoholism the same way 
that uh, you would recover from self-righteous legalism. The same way, self-right, or uh, not, you would recover from it by post-salvation, epistemological rehabilitation. And that means growing in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's the only way is through spiritual growth. Not spiritual perfection, you'll never be perfect, but spiritual growth. And let's see. Well, these are shorter messages, so I'll go on to read more in this in the next message, and also to uh, continue with some more parameters of what we need to understand. Just consider this a mini-introduction. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and challenge us by these things. In Christ's name we ask it, amen.